first of all, Professor Sandel, the rise of populism around the world? I think it reflects anxiety and anger and frustration with the existing terms of public discourse. Throughout, in societies around the world, there's tremendous frustration with politics and with established parties. And to a large extent, I think this reflects the failure of elites, of the mainstream parties, to address questions that people care about, questions that really matter. The populism takes sometimes dark and dangerous forms, and that means that the responsible parties have to do a better job of addressing those frustrations. What can they do to address those frustrations? Is it a communication issue? Or is it the fundamental faults of the current systems? Well, I think it's not just a communications issue. I think it's about substance, the substance of our politics today. We've lived through a, a period of roughly three decades of a kind of globalization, a market-driven globalization that has brought many benefits, but it has those benefits have not been equally shared across societies. So the mainstream parties need to address, you described the wealth gap, the, the, the growing inequality, um, and also a sense that people, people want to have a say in controlling the forces that govern their lives. They feel that community is unraveling, a sense of, of solidarity, a sense of shared fate right. is unraveling. And so I think that the responsible parties have to find a way to address seriously questions of inequality, the erosion of community, and the sense of disempowerment. Is it being translated into actions? So far, it's been translated into actions, into effective political appeals, mainly by those who appeal to the worst instincts mm. of frustrated. Give me an example. Like, well, Donald Trump in the United States has very successfully uh, seized on the issue of immigration, but he's done it in a way that is uh, deeply insulting and offensive to minorities, to Muslims, for example, and uh, to, to Mexicans, talking about the border with Mexico. Immigration is one of the most volatile questions we face in countries around the world, and it easily lends itself to dangerous and intolerant views, putting up walls to keep people out uh, and vilifying minorities. I think the energy behind Brexit in the UK, uh, leaving Europe, also a lot of that was about immigration. I think the issue of immigration stands for a larger set of worries. It isn't only about immigrants because many of the voters who seem to respond to that issue live in places where there are actually very few immigrants. I think it stands for a sense that people feel they're less and less in control of the forces that govern their lives. In the economy, they feel shut out of economic opportunity with growing inequality, and also they feel that the culture has left them behind, that ordinary work is not respected. So I think part of a more responsible politics has to include not only the concern with inequality, but also a renewed respect for work and the meaning of work. There has been such a financialization yes. of our economy. Yes. And therefore, the way people work, the kind of people being respected, yes. have been changing totally. Yes. Is it possible to change that or reverse that? No, not going back to the old days, except uh, I do think it's, it's you mentioned financial, the rewards that go to, to those at the top. Uh, increasingly, those uh, are those in the financial uh, sphere. The financial and professional class have reaped by far the greatest proportion of the benefits of globalization, of market-driven globalization. And the effect has been that financial speculation has been hugely rewarded but people who do ordinary work in the traditional sense, they not only have suffered economic disadvantage, but the prestige and the social recognition has gone to those in the financial and professional classes. And so people in, in working classes rightly feel that their work, their contributions 
are not respected. And I think that's what we have to take seriously and think about and address in a meaningful way. What then, Professor? Well, what forms of work do? Now, the, the implicit answer that we've been giving to that question during the age, uh, the, the market triumphalist uh, past three decades of a kind of neoliberal market-driven globalization, the implicit answer is financial speculation and, and pro the professional classes make the greatest contribution to the common good because their work seems to contribute most to GDP. I think we need to examine that assumption. I think it's flawed. Much of the increased financial activity of the past three decades uh, has not had uh, a direct, uh, a proportionate impact on either GDP or more broadly the public good. Mm. Whereas we have disparaged and failed to respect the contributions to the common good of teachers, of people who make things, mm -hmm. uh, and, and people who contribute to the economy in other ways, who contribute to health, to education, and to the making of things that are important to, to, to the good life. After the financialization of our right. economy, you're having the innovationalization in a way of our economy. At least entrepreneurship, innovative figures, they are being respected the most. Uh, it's true. Someone like Steve Jobs, who creates useful things that, Im that people feel improves their lives, that's, that's a very tangible kind of contribution. So entrepreneurship and innovation do contribute very importantly to the val things that make for a good life. But much of the financial speculation is not enabling investment in the real economy. So that's one question. But there's a broader question. Take some of the, our greatest sports stars and celebrities who make tens of millions of dollars and compare their rewards to the way we reward teaching, for example, or being a nurse contributing to people's education or health. Is the contribution of a sports star really a thousand times greater to the common good than that of a school teacher or of a nurse? This is the kind of question that I put, or, or a banker, compare a, what a banker uh, on Wall Street uh, makes compared to what a school teacher or a nurse makes. Now, you may say these are, the, these are just abstract philosophical questions, but I think they raise fundamental questions about justice, about equality and inequality, and about the meaning of a contribution to the common good that we need to debate. What shall we change? Shall we change the proportion between social recognition and financial rewards, or shall we change the fundamental perception? Well, I think we need to work on both. So, for example, we hear there are many debates to today about whether to establish a living wage for people who, uh, people in, who do work that is not generously rewarded by the economy. Should there be a living wage? Um, beyond a minimum wage, a bare subsistence wage. The living wage is partly about economics, but it's also about social recognition. So I think we need to have these two debates together. What should be the financial and economic rewards? What is worthy? What contributions are worthy of social recognition? And those debates have to go together. Mm. It also connects to the contributions people make in their role within families, raising children. The, now there, traditionally, uh, is perhaps the greatest gap between financial reward and social recognition. Especially for women. Are, yes, but the, the debates about a paid family leave, for example, or support for childcare for women who are in the workforce, are these debates about economic rewards or social recognition? They're about both. Right. And so I think... And we can do both, you think? I think so. We're capable of doing both? Well, we have to try. Mm. We have but to you try know, to Professor do a better, Sandra, job, yeah. a better job of doing both. Here's why. Here's why. Because what's happened when we've allowed markets and market values 
to define the value of social contributions, the gap between the true underlying value and the financial reward, uh, that gap has grown greater and greater. In Europe, many of the economy are suffering a lot because of the overwhelming welfare system the EU has earlier promised its citizens. Countries follow suit, that's why they joined the EU, many of them. But now it seems that it could not work because nobody knows where the money comes from. So are we talking about, when you are saying we should work on both fronts, are we talking about overwhelming social burdens or financial burdens for social justice? Well, I think the, the fundamental thing we have to take up is we have to question the assumption, which has become widespread in the last few decades, that markets um, are the primary instrument for defining and achieving the public good. So you're not for the European style overwhelming welfare system? Well, I'm in favor. The welfare state has made a great contribution as a counterweight to unfettered markets. That was one of the great achievements. But some of them have problems. Well, there are problems, that, that, there are problems with the EU that have to do with governance, independent of this question of the welfare state. So there are problems of governance and uh, a sense people have that they can really have a meaningful say, or is the power too distant? That's one issue. And the other issue is the one that you've raised earlier about the welfare state. I think we can find ways of financing through fair tax systems, generous welfare states to provide for the health and the education and a dignified retirement mm. of people. I think that can be achieved but the problem, uh, many of the problems with the European Union have to do with the sense that the power is unaccountable, that, that civil servants and bureaucrats in Brussels, many people feel, are dictating policies to ordinary citizens around Europe. So that problem needs to be addressed, but that's a separate problem from the idea of the welfare state as a counterweight to an unfettered market. There has been a lot of debate about markets, morals, yeah. and money. Um, you have been doing a lot of research, a lot of provocative speeches about those issues. What do you make of it? What do you think is the current stage of realization that you can feel the pulse of the public yeah. when it comes to these issues? When I visit China and speak to audiences, especially young people, there is a, a great enthusiasm for market reasoning and for market thinking, understandably so, because the opening up of markets in China has had enormous benefits, lifting uh, enormous numbers of people out of poverty and creating a flourishing middle class. And yet what I also sense in these very same audiences, and especially among young people, is that after a certain level of affluence is achieved, people begin to ask, is there something more to the good life than material prosperity alone? And this question is being asked with greater and greater intensity, I find, not only in China, but in Europe, in the US, in Latin America, in countries around the world that have achieved a certain level of material prosperity and affluence. People ask, well, what about the environment? What about the quality of air we breathe? Uh, what about social cohesion and a sense of community? What about family life and the importance of family ties? So at a certain point, people begin, and I think that we've reached that point today, to ask with growing urgency, is there more to the good life than material affluence alone? Thank you so much, Professor Sandel, for being with us. Thank you, Kim. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.